Hi everyone, it's Ross Anderson here from Brave New World Wine in Sydney and welcome to episode number four of uh, Meet the Maker. And as always, we hope to inform, entertain and educate you with these interviews. Now, as COVID-19 continues to impact and redefine the global wine industry, it's great to see that our industry is finding new ways of engaging with you, the consumer. One of the many positives to take from the global situation is this rapid adoption of streaming technology and the ability and willingness of wine producers from around the world to participate and engage with you, the consumer, straight into your living room. Today's episode sees us moving away from South Africa and from rock stars in Los Angeles, and we're moving across the Dutch uh, to number one family estate in New Zealand. And to celebrate this, I never thought I'd do this, I'm getting my all black scarf out. <laughs> It's just pure danger from the South African perspective. Anyway, now over the past five years, you can hear her laughing in the background already. And I've been fortunate to work with Number One Family Estate through various other business endeavours that I'm involved with, namely the Six Nations Global Fine Wine Challenge and the Australian and New Zealand Boutique Wine Show. Now, I met uh, today's guest in 2018 when Number One uh, Family Estate, I think it was the Reserve Cuvée, but um, she will tell us in a minute, um, took out the, the top awards. And so we, we met in Sydney and we had a great evening, but little did I know that our guest has an interesting alter ego um, with several television and movie appearances thrown into boot. So without any further ado, please welcome direct from New Zealand, from Marlborough in New Zealand, Miss Virginie Lebrun. Hello. And there she is. Hello, Virginie. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Welcome. Much, rather. <laughs> it looks like a beautiful warm day or warm evening in Marlborough. Was it minus four? If you're inside, it, it, apparently it will get down to minus four overnight. So a little bit of a dangerous time for some, but no, it's good. It's it's a nice uh, thing to be all I like your scarf. That'll, uh, yeah, help you keep nice and warm. There's a story attached to this scarf. Problem. Oh, really? I was, I, was, uh, I was at the World Cup. Uh, when the World Cup was in Australia a couple of years ago now, uh, I went to watch Wales play. I can't remember who they were playing. It was some Wales versus Ireland. And I went in my Springbok jersey and there was a, a Kiwi behind us giving me giving me welly because I was in my Springbok gear. Um, but anyway, it, it ended up well without swapping scarves. So he's walking around with a Springbok scarf and I've got his Kiwi scarf. But there you go. Oh, now, good men. Good on you guys. How cool. <laughs> thanks so much for joining us. Um, you, you've got a very interesting story and we're really looking forward to exploring that uh, with you over the next half an hour or so. But to kick things off, how are things in uh, New Zealand? Can you give us a bit of a snapshot of uh, the wine industry, the state of play and, and what's happening? What's the vibe in the industry at the moment? Sure. It's, um, well, it's interesting. It's constantly evolving, I think, now that, you know, that we're getting into this new normal or developing a new normal um, so it's different for sure but I think one of the really wonderful things that it's all allowed us to do is actually really kind of take the ball by the horns a little bit in the sense that we can we can connect with our customers more directly and in, in the very way that we are now which is great and it's sort of pushing us to do a bit more of that and um, lucky for me talking is kind of my shtick as they say so um so i have no problem doing that kind of thing and it's nice too so i can kind of where we are i can kind of be the driver of that for for our winery and then pull other people into and to do it and introduce introduce the world not only to more of what number one family estate do but the people behind it as well which is really cool so i had my younger brother remy who is um our apprentice winemaker and i i did and viticulturalist as well out in the vineyard. So I did a one with him on pruning the other day, and then I did one with um, our master disgorger, Joffy Bruce, in, in the winery the other day too, and he's a natural performer. It was fantastic. It was really good. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's depending on how you look at it, of course. It's more of a challenge. Retail is taking more of a forefront, maybe a bit more grocery a little bit less on uh, with the on trade perhaps but yeah it's developing all the time and it's but it's it's one of those things you've got to remain you've got to remain positive and and yeah just keep moving forward but so far we're really enjoying it it's not it's not been horrendous it could be worse lockdown with bubbles you know that sort of thing 
<laughs> oh, that's terrible. That sounds horrid. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I'm loving. Uh, I'm loving the adoption of the new tech. Uh, it just makes it so much more personal, uh, and people yeah, can really totally. reach right into your operation and understand it, and, 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 as opposed to just the the marketing veneer glaze on the outside. We really see the nuts yeah. and bolts and the personalities behind the brand. And, and on that vision, can you tell us a bit about the history of Number One uh, Family yeah, State? Uh, when it sure. all started, and, and and why Marlborough? Sure, no problem. What I am trying to do, though, oh shivers, where did you go? Go back. I've uh, I've just made you bigger. You've just made. <laughs> oh, we just lost Virginie. Let's just reconnect her now. She's been pushing buttons. So sorry about that, everyone. That's what happens when it's minus one degrees in sunny Marlborough. Uh, here she comes, and yeah. she's back. <laughs> maybe maybe I just won't touch the screen and I'll just kind of maybe you just here and squint like a little old lady because I can't see that I can see you you're very small but anyway uh, I, I digress and go back to explaining number one so um, we we've actually been in the Marlborough Valley for um, 40 years this year so we uh, moved to Marlborough from central North Island uh, my father Daniel is actually a Champagne one native uh, or a native of Champagne, if you will, uh, and my mum comes from the north of England. And they actually met and married in the central North Island. So we moved down here in 1980 when I was three months old and started our first winery. We ended up leaving that winery and, um, and beginning again as number one family estate, and that was uh, 1997. So yeah, this, this winery itself has been in play not that entire time, but certainly it's a long long history of, of us being in Marlborough and before that too, but I won't jump the gun on your questions. I'll, I'll allow you to, to ask them rather than me t saying too much already. <laughs> and, and was there a conscious decision to establish in Marlborough? Um, yes, definitely. Or, or sure? No, most definitely there was. That just reminded me I should have gone and grabbed those photos. I think I've got something here. Yeah, it definitely was. So Papa actually, so I call my dad Papa. I've never called him dad i think i did once actually and i got in a bit of trouble for that so i didn't do it again funnily enough is that a french thing or is it a yeah, family definitely. thing or? yeah right. papa is like um is is um is dad but in french so um and i'll show you this just really quickly i think there's also stuff on our website but papa made a trip down to marlborough because he'd heard that the sunshine hours exceeded that of champagne by 600 hours per annum and that's just phenomenal. You know, by comparison, that is like a, a vintage year in Champagne, but each and every single year. Just just un, almost unheard of over there. They're so lucky with if they get the kind of sunshine that we get, but we get it every year. So anyway, you heard that. And um, really, it wasn't until he made a trip down to, to Marlborough um, with uh, my uncle, and they saw the land that this, this is a really cool photo I'll show you. I've got the hard copy. I don't know why I didn't think to grab it before. But anyway, I'll show you on my um, laptop. So Papa, before I show it to you, does something when he's usually excited or frustrated. And that, unlike me, I have fingernails. Papa really doesn't. He's chewed them all back to the quick. And he, that's when he chews them. So this photograph was taken on that trip in 1978 when he came down to, to see the Tawa, knowing that the land prices were very good and also... Yeah, the sunshine exceeded that of champagne by 600 hours per annum. So if you can just sort of see that, he's got a pretty good, it's like two hands on the nail biting operation in that photograph. <laughs> so I'm super proud of it. Next time I'd have a, I'd have a hard copy to show you because it won't be so, here's my computer. So anyway. And so <laughs> was, that, was that from excitement at the prospect or nervousness at the challenge was, or both? I think it, no, I think it was a combination of excitement for the prospect of, why is nobody else here yet? Why is everybody not here yet? You know, um, not nobody else. There were certainly a handful of growers. Um, I think we were the third equal in the valley to actually begin producing wine, but there certainly were a hand, well, winemaking from that. But there certainly were a handful of growers here at the time too. But it was, you know, it was mainly fruit trees and farming. And you kind of look at that land and think, my goodness, you know, to the untrained eye, I suppose, those of us who aren't, um, you know, viticulturalists, et cetera, we'd say, gosh, does anything, is it even possible to grow anything here? Much like parts of Australia too, you know, um, and of course we, we know well they produce beautiful wines. Uh, so it was frustration that 
he wasn't already doing it. <laughs> and I think, um, and excitement that this was, you know, he wanted to be doing it yesterday and he was then going to, of course, make it happen. So um, at two years later, we moved to Marlborough and the rest, they say, is history. But, yeah. So on to, on to Papa and the Le Brun uh, family name, which is synonymous yeah. with, with Champagne. Tell us a little bit about that Champagne connection and what does that historical timeline look like? Have you, have you traced it back? Are you, you know, yes. what's the story? I, I'm into the whole genealogy thing and family <laughs> trees. I, I love that kind of stuff. I reckon I'm related okay. to, you know, a, a king of Scotland, many reduced or many, many removed, but that's another story. So, <laughs> <laughs> A good one by the sound of it, yeah. Um, so, yes, indeed. We, and we even have our um, little tea towels that you can actually buy from us in the cellar door and, um, and our shop online. So we trace, obviously, I've just told you Marlborough since 1980 and prior to that, uh, Champagne six, since 1684. So 1684 is when we trace our, um, our vine growing roots to. And it was about 100 years after that that we actually began producing Champagne in the village of Mont Blanc in Champagne. So, yes, we do trace it back. <laughs> Papa is, in fact, a 12th generation champagne maker, bona fide. Wow. So, um, yeah, no pressure, right? <laughs> <laughs> I just so realised we haven't us? even opened a bottle yet. What oh, are we actually, doing? that's a good idea. Yeah. So what are we drinking? Uh, and I've got a question for you about that. I've got yeah. all three bottles lined up. Cool. Um, and I don't know what glass is supposed to use. I know which one I want to use, but what would you recommend? I've got this little number. Oh yeah, that's not uh, un, that's not tulip. unlike the tulip I'm rocking. Yeah. Or well, should we just rock the tulips? Sure, but it's what do you the, want to use? It's either, I won't. It's either that or it's the the bucket. But I think we'll you go can the do tulip. The bucket. You can totally do the bucket. Tulip. My brother Remy is oh. very very pro using the balloons and the likes of say um, Krug, another Remy, Remy Krug also believes in in using the nice big balloons as well because it just bucket it, is. it gives you more to aerate everything and. And hold the smell. So it's it's personal preference, I think, really. I just didn't want to offend you by choosing the wrong glassware. Um, what right, are we I'm in... not going to get too precious about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wearing this, you know. I've got brownie points. What are we? Uh, yeah. What are we tasting? I've got all three lined up. What are you opening? Okay, so I've just opened the assemblé, and so I'm going to pour a little taste of that. All right, I'll get that bad boy open. So while I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. um, Vishni, you have a very interesting story. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background, your travels, and your career before wine. Oh, sure. Um, so I think obviously wine's always been in the in the picture for me in some capacity. I, you know, grew up around it. So to some degree, I think some of it's sort of a little bit like osmosis, really. Uh, but um, but also I from quite a young age my parents will tell you I spoke at a fairly young age and and unfortunately I just didn't stop so that uh really did <laughs> flow over into my chosen careers <laughs> um so yeah I started I actually started um I left school a term early actually to um take up a job offer of a job uh, presenting a music tv channel in um in Auckland called Juice TV so I was at school down at Christchurch, and they, that's their job. And, um, <laughs> um, and, and they, um, yeah, they offered me a job uh, pr um, presenting a show from four to six every day, roughly, four to seven, sort of altered through the years. And to me, that was the zenith. I never actually dreamed any bigger than that. But prior to, you know, getting into music like any self-respecting teenager, I might add, um, it was, <laughs> I really liked, um, I really liked acting and really enjoyed the theatre and things like that. And then I started taking music very seriously and it all, to me, the zenith became wanting to be a music TV presenter on Juice TV. Nothing else that was just what I had my sights on, what I wanted at 16 years old. And then two years later made it happen. So I did that for about seven years um, and then did a few other presenting shows like uh, What Now? Um, I'm not sure what the equivalent is in in Oz. If you're in the UK, What Now is like Blue Pizza over there. It's a kids' TV show. It runs live for a couple of hours, and that was amazing. That was a, that was a little bit of a, a childhood dream come true. Um, and, yeah, I did. And then after that, I did a bit of stunt work, a bit of um, – so 
not quite stunt doubles, but stunt performers sort of thing um, in film and telly. And uh, yeah, and then and then I did some acting after that and a bit of crew work too. So yeah, but it spanned a spanned a good while, <laughs> decade yeah. decade or two. <laughs> so yeah. So I went um, <laughs> I went digging around the internet. Uh, oh God. yesterday and today um, <laughs> and I'm not going to embarrass you I haven't got anything but I saw no, the I Juice TV interviews uh, I mean I've been searching through the IMDB database uh, googling and googling and YouTubing and searching I found you as the, the doctor on the, that soap opera uh, in New Zealand Shortland Street, uh, yeah. Shortland Street. you seem quite clinical in your uh, knowledge about removing a headache or something and you remove <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's pretty yeah. crazy. Um, that, and then, that character was fun. She had, um, she was a neurosurgeon because that's what you think when you look at me, isn't it? Obviously, absolutely. but anyway, <laughs> she was a, she was a neurosurgeon with a Spurgeous syndrome. So she was very, very particular, very direct. Um, but it was fascinating. I didn't even know what a Spurgeous was when I auditioned for the role. So it was really cool. Um, it was really great fun. Very interesting to did do. You feature, did you feature on uh, Neighbours at all? I did. I did, I did a, I think did an episode or two. I can't remember. It was, again, strangely enough, ended up in the hospital. What? And Neighbours? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I just can't get away. Can I? No. Um, but that was really cool. Again, it was, it was great to both are considered very much to be um, – First, fast turnaround TV. So, and th that's almost like ultra fast turnaround. I mean, they can consider shooting, say, American TV shows fast turnaround if they give them, that might be like a week or two to sh shoot an episode. And if you say that to someone who, if you call that fast turnaround TV to someone that works on something like Shortland Street or Neighbours or Home and Away, they'll just laugh and go, yeah, that's not fast turnaround. When you work on a, on a, a soap opera like those shows, you're turning around an episode a day, and that is just oh. whiplash fast. <laughs> so it, it so certainly you didn't get it done. Yeah, yeah. If you didn't feel like you could have called yourself an actor before you did that show, like for a period of months <laughs> or whatever, by the time you were done, you're like, yeah, no, I think I earned that now. I may not be a good actor, but I'm an actor for sure. So yeah, <laughs> but yeah. Tell us, um, one, tell us a little bit about some movies. Any Seconds any out. movies that come to mind? Um. Yeah, uh, that you've worked all, on. Yeah, all, all sorts. Really, I thought because you told me we were going to have a chat about this, I was like, oh gosh, I guess I go. I best guess I'd better go and have a look at what I did do. And yeah, no, I've had a good look. Yeah. <laughs> what was your? Tell us a few of the movies. Give us a few of the titles, and then tell us which was your favourite one to 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 feature in or or work alongside. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, there was there's uh, all sorts of stuff. Gosh, um, so. Uh, I, I like them all for different reasons. Prince Caspian, uh, one of the Narnia films, was pretty amazing. I didn't act in that. I was doing um, so uh, prosthetics fabrication and maintenance on set. So I was part of the team that um, would brush down the minotaurs and the satyrs and put put the heads on the um, on the extras and on the stunties, and they'd button up sort of appropriately. I'm wearing fur, fake fur. I might just say it's te not it's teddy bear fur. It's not real fur. Don't do that. Um, but they so we don't push on all the domes and then brush down with with brushes the hair so it all moved in the way that it would on an animal, like you know, on on an anim animal of that kind to make it look natural and seamless before they went on set and then they'd come off set and we'd sort of deal with that, take their heads off and look after them, that sort of thing. Try to stop them from passing out in the heat, which was probably close to forty degrees in the Czech summer um, <laughs> over over in Prague. So yeah, that was that was really good fun. The people that I met on that was amazing, and seeing seeing a production of that scale operating too was just incredible. And we did lots of travel with that and and stuff too. So that was really nice. That was great. And I still have friends that I keep in touch with today. Um, a couple of girls in particular, I, I I still see now and then if we go through LA, like Tammy Lane. She's an amazing um, prosthetics makeup artist and, and an Oscar winner, I might add. She'll go like, oh, don't say that. But anyway, I did it now. But she's a wonderful person. And Beth Hathaway as well. They're both fantastic prosthetics um, artists and fabricators. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was so cool to learn something about another department as well, you know, and appreciate what everyone does. But, yeah. 
So that was cool. Um, but all sorts of stuff. And then one of the last thing I did was of a film was uh, The Journey. And that was shot in Belfast. So I got to try my first ever Guinness. Yay. And it's so true. They really do, do taste better. Have you had Guinness in, in Ireland, Ross? Dublin Gate, absolutely. <laughs> there you go. Oh, you've had it there. Oh, fine then. My job. I don't no, know I haven't actually. Belfast, I've had it but... from there. I haven't been to Ireland. I've had it from the distillery. <laughs> oh, okay, that's all right. <laughs> from the brewery. That's all good. No, but it's it's true. You know, people talk it up, but it's it's so true, right? And uh, Guinness from genuinely legit Bruden Island is, is something else. It's an amazing drink. Uh, but yeah, so I met Timothy Spall. I was in a scene with Timothy Spall, Freddie Highmore, and um, uh, Colin Meaney. And that was on a, on it was the very last scene of the film, uh, I think. And yeah, they're all, all, we're all on this private jet together. And it was like, wow, this is kind of first time I'd been on a private jet. And, and certainly it was, it was pretty cool to actually interact with those guys and have a chat and yeah it was humbling it was really cool what was your role with um uh what's the movie i frankenstein and with underworld oh yeah um so i frankenstein i got to be uh elizabeth frankenstein mrs frankenstein actually shot that over in um melbourne too it was really good right. fun in victoria um and so that was that was pretty cool and um and what was the other one um Underworld. You said Underworld, yes. So for that, I kind of, I had a couple, a couple of different hats. One was that I was the um, stand-in. So, oh, no. A lot of people back to say, oh, you've been a stand-in. It's like, yes, I've been a stand-in. <laughs> but I'm also in crew work. So it's essentially the same thing. You're just kind of a moving piece of the set. Stand in the set for lighting. Okay, you'll go and stand there. Do this with your arms because that's what she does. I can't do that anymore. <laughs> Um, that sort of thing, but uh, they they also got me to um, be like a shadow double for the actress. So in in one scene, I'm actually in it twice, which is bizarre. So it's a scene where Lucian or the um, the the main werewolf, the lead werewolf, if you will, is getting the lash out in the out in the uh, courtyard kind of thing, and um, there's a bunch of vampires standing around and watching um, with uh, Bill Nighy and. Um, and then they all walk inside. But before they walk inside, Lucian looks up to the window and sees the, the uh, Ronometra's or a shadow, which is supposed to be Ronometra's character, um, Sonia, I think it is. And that was me. That was, I was a shadow as well as one of the extra vampires. I'm like, there I am and there I am. Oh, wow. So yeah. <laughs> did, Fairly did, you get to, um, <laughs> did you get to meet some of these actors like Bill Nye or, or yeah. not really? Yeah, he was. He's one he of my favorite, he's an favorite actors. Yeah, I, I love everything what, he does. And when you and if you get the chance to meet him, he does not disappoint. Uh, on set, you hear of some actors that are a bit, you know, not so great, or they don't interact, or or they want to be the very, I don't know, method or something of wanting to be in that character the whole day, and and they they actually can't interact with people for that reason, or they they have to do some in character. Or whatever, something has, someone has something going on, and that's fine. That's their process. But Bill and I, he will talk to everyone. He's an absolute sweetheart. So everyone from the safety guy to the the grip and and the gaffer, the cameraman, the the extras, you know, yeah. everybody. He's got time for everyone. He's he's just a lovely, lovely guy. So I certainly did have yeah some conversations with him, which were pretty cool. Although it was quite difficult because he'd have his eyes in, you know, his contact lenses with those icy blue <laughs> eyes. And honestly, I just couldn't really look at him. I was like, I might burst into flames if I look at him for too long. But it was, it was um, also a little bit of starstruck too. He was, he's a very nice person. And, and Kate Beckinsale? Uh, she, wasn't, to... she wasn't on that film. That was the Underworld for, film that she wasn't in. Oh, that was the... It, it was Rona Mitra was the, the female. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, that's very cool. I, uh, but, yeah, yeah, that was, I, that I was the a... first time I, I kind of got the taste for wanting to do a bit of stunt work too. So that was kind of in between doing presenting work and then crossing over into acting. I did crew work and, and I got a taste of doing stunt work because they needed to do a camera test. So one of the stunties showed me how to crack a whip. And I was like, awesome. Yeah. So I did that in my 
sexy vampire costume at the time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I had to walk around the corner on the set, crack the whip, and they were they were shooting it in high frames per second, very fast, um, and fast up. And uh, it just was all in slow motion. It was like, yes, if only I could look that amazing and appear that cool all the time. But yes, it was good fun. Have the whip. And, and I thought I wanted to no, it wasn't my whip. Bring it to work. <laughs> <laughs> Get in line. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be good fun. No, it's um but that sort of gave me the idea of gosh, I'd really love to get into doing stunt work. And that is stunt work is arguably as fun as doing acting. You still get to jump around in a costume and actually kind of look like a badass and do fights and stuff like that. So yeah, this cool. So with, all, with all this excitement and, and mm -hmm. travelling in Prague and America and uh, Ireland and Melbourne and all those places, how did you get into wine? I mean, obviously your family's in wine, but how did you get into wine? What, what, was, that, sure. what was that thing that, that, that tweaked and, and you thought, right, I want to change and get into the family business? I think it's funny because I actually moved um, in a former life, if you will. I moved over to the UK um, and I started I got a job in a wine and spirit shop. So I actually started working for a company called Amethyst Drinks. And that, I actually, I sort of, I wasn't actually sure that I'd be able, be capable of, of doing something other than what I had done. But that really did show me that not only was I capable, I loved it. I really enjoyed it. It was so social and, and fun. But I guess they kindly took me on. And I, I suppose I had the background of, having knowledge of, pardon me, um, champagne, new world wines and the like. So, you know, I could, we all sort of had our strengths or specialities. So, you know, I could uh, chat a little bit about South African or Australian, New Zealand wines, etc. cetera. And, um, and I, I still could hold my own pretty well when talking about bubbles, etc. cetera, too. So, um, but yeah, so it was that. And not only that, though, when I was there, um, did I enjoy that and did I get more of a view into it? I think when you're growing up, and like any kid, you get you get exposure to the sort of things that your family does, and you think, oh, okay, well, my dad's a teacher, or what have you. My dad does this or does that, and I went away to the UK, of course, knowing in in my logical mind, my my father is a good winemaker. You know, he makes wine, he does it well, what have you. And when I got over there and began working for Amethyst, it just blew my mind. Because not only did did I have our papa's winemaking as a for comparison, but I got to try then all sorts of stuff on the world stage. So we'd do master classes in Krug. Uh, I tried Salos, so French Quarters, Carvers, Proseccos, just about anything you can throw a stick at that is sparkling. I I got a view into that world, and in doing so, I went from being yeah, my, you know, my dad's, yeah, it's all right. He's a good one. I get to, oh, no. Oh, my Lord. No, Papa is far from that. He is an exceptional winemaker. And I mean that with every cell of my being. Not only is he an exceptional winemaker, my mother is an exceptional marketer and, and, and brain behind the business. And it, I, honestly, I don't think it was until that point that I truly knew how ridiculously fortunate I am, and my brother and I are, you know, and essentially we are the custodians for that, for that legacy, you know, and I do not take it for granted. <laughs> Perhaps I did before, I will, I will admit. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, uh, and that's very cool. And, and, it's but, cool when yeah, you can so recognise that. Yeah, part of it, for sure. Yeah, and, and, so and while also we're talking the about that, with champagne. Oh, sorry. No, no. Next, you, please. Next one. No, no. I, I just want to say while, while you're talking about that, tell us a little about uh, a little bit about the uh, number one assemble. Sure, assemble. Uh, so everyone playing at home. Yes, indeed. So assemble is. Have a sip. I've already finished. I need to fill up again. <laughs> <laughs> Be, of Sorry. course, go for it. It's been a long day. <laughs> That's all right. Imagine so. It's all good. So um, assemble is a blend of sixty percent chardonnay, thirty-five percent pinot noir, and five percent of pinot meunier. So that's what we would refer to as being a classic blend um, and it's it's really good sort of seasonal drinking like right now it's gorgeous you get some like baked stone fruit characters in there um, some little bit of white flour as well and I think it's 
to me that, that this is big for the English as well. They really love assembly. It's very, very much to their to their palate, if you will. So yeah, and yep. it's it's an ode to bringing together those those varieties too. Whereas whereas some of the other wines that we do are some you know they're a lot of single variety in there. So yeah. Exhibit, exhibit A. <laughs> exhibit A. There number you go. one, number one cuvee, Blanc de Blanc, uh, non vintage. I'm grab mine <laughs> while you're talking about that. <laughs> I was hoping you were going to open that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. You can finally get to it now, right? <laughs> okay. So that, that was the, the Blanc de Blanc Chardonnay, and then there's uh, exhibit two, number one uh, rose, which is the 100% yeah. uh, yeah. Pinot Noir, mm -hmm. um, which uh i'm not supposed to play favorites but i gotta say i think this is my fave um yeah i'm not meant to say it either but <laughs> well wow, see me too it's yeah. and then oh, on top of on top of the um on top of the standard range you've got the cuvées you've got the cuvée remini for your brother you've got the cuvée virginie for yourself you've got cuvée yeah. adele for your mum yeah so you um, can see that and then she is the most glamorous member of the family so this is Oh, this is Mum's. Is that the one? I try not to pull is that the, the one with down. the Swarovski box on it? It sure is. Oh, that's oh, yeah. the most crazy packaging I've ever seen. It light, lights Isn't up it when you open the box. It's it, mental. It does. <laughs> Plenty of drama in all the right ways. <laughs> <laughs> See how gorgeous. I don't make commentary on that? Plenty of drama. There you go. <laughs> da -da 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 -da. <laughs> so, Virginie. Um, yes. Yeah. So, number yes, one is. Here we go. <laughs> uh, Wind up. Number one is a specialist sparkling producer. That's all you guys do. Yeah, that's correct. And that, 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 that's amazing in its own right. But has there ever been a temptation to bottle um, non-sparkling wines like a Chardonnay and a Pinot Noir or even a Pinot Munier as a still wine or we, it's never crossed your mind? We did to begin with, uh, in the beginning as a Salia Le Brun, so in the 80s we did, but really we came back to focus on, on doing method traditional. Papa is from Champagne, our family is from Champagne, and it's, it's what we're known for, it's our passion, so that's what we do. Don't get me wrong, there are, from time to time, there's certainly, <laughs> from, um, from a business point of view, it, would, it, it is appealing to do just, just you know, not just still not just sparkling wine but still wine as well because unfortunately um and they don't do this in champagne but uh the government likes to charge you tax uh so a different level of taxation um between being in the tank when the wine is in the tank to when the wine actually goes into the bottle so once it's in the bottle don't ask me how much because i don't have it off the top of my head but once the wine is in the bottle you're actually taxed at a higher rate um, because they're viewing it as being essentially finished goods, which is, is not the case, <laughs> far from it. Because, of course, the wine needs to be in the bottle, on the lees, for a minimum of 18 months. So, and that can go all the way up to two years. I mean, so all the way up to eight years. It's two years for number one, 18 months for assembly, and eight years for the reserve. So that is, and it's not quite the same with still wine. You don't get taxed at quite the same rate. Yeah. So... And as we know, something like Sauvignon Blanc, you can turn that around in six months if you want, or less, 12 weeks, I think. Yeah, minimum 12 weeks, I think. But so don't get me wrong, there are times when that would be very appealing. <laughs> that would be very appealing to do stills, but yeah. And, and in your experience, in your opinion, why is the number one site so well suited to producing excellent Chardonnay, excellent Pinot Noir, and, and excellent Pinot Munier? Like, is there something specific about it that, is it uh, altitude? Is it slope? Is it? Uh, I mean, you mentioned the sunlight hours at the start of the conversation, but is there any anything else that just comes together? Uh, and yeah, in in that in that whole frame, are there any other guys making really good sparkling wine in your area, or did you think yeah. Papa got yeah. the right site? He just he nailed it forty years ago, and, he, and he's he's running it. <laughs> so we definitely. I mean, we're we're quite fortunate um, in the sense that. Uh, we're actually part of a group called Method Marlborough. And Method Marlborough is there's a little logo, I believe, on the back of that bottle. So that's the Method Marlborough logo there. Yep. And the idea yep. behind Method Marlborough, we're a founding member of the group, I uh, believe, don't quote me, I have to check it, but there's, there's about 12 wineries, maybe even more now. Um, so to be part of the Method Marlborough group, you must adhere to certain things. 
Uh, one of those things being that you cannot have the wine under a crown seal as a, the closure for the finish needs to be a cork and a muesli. So it can't be a crown mm -hmm. seal. Of course, we do put a crown seal on for the years where it's being lees aged and your lees aging or bottle, you know, the, while the yeast is inside the bottle uh, creating the bubble, um, you, you need to do that for a minimum of 18 months. And actually in Champagne, it's a minimum of only 15 months. So in that regard, our restrictions are even stricter again. Yeah. In some regards, don't get me wrong, Champagne is that appellation is something else, but <laughs> it is really, it's, a, it's the essence of it is method of Marlborough, much like the appellation of Champagne is about quality control. So as, yeah, that's, um, you know, we can all get into how quality control can go out the window when it comes to certain things. If, if you want to make something very cheaply, you can do, uh, yeah. you know, it's always the case. Yeah. in the market and then it's not to say all of it is good there is some very good but there's plenty of bargain type stuff <laughs> <laughs> no no <laughs> careful still the diplomat hear the roaring of the of the region already no um <laughs> no it's um but it's i think australia had something similar too though years ago i believe i remember hearing that merlot was being overcropped you know and it would just and it just it started to have an effect almost on on not only the region that was regions that were producing the wine but on australian wine as a brand as a whole you know and you and you kind of want to you want to maintain a certain level of of quality so that's part of what that's about anyway so there are various uh members in that group and then you also asked about the number one family estate site yeah. so According to um, Genesis Robinson uh, and, oh gosh, you, the name is gone and her mum will be yelling Johnson? at me from the house. I can hear it. Hugh Johnson, thank you. Yes, <laughs> got that all wrong. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Genesis Robinson and Hugh Johnson in, in their uh, encyclopedia of, um, yep. of wine. They tell you that all that is north of State Highway 6, so heading... I know you can't see out where I'm pointing, but anyway, <laughs> north of State Highway 6. Ten, that that way, yeah. Back no, to the Wither Hills. <laughs> You're like, yeah. down, it doesn't yeah. matter. If you're that, that way. Probably yeah. there. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so um, <laughs> heading with your back to the Wither Hills, heading towards towards the hills covered in forestry or in the direction of like Nelson Picton that way. So the State Highway 6, north of that, are the most fertile lands of well, soils of the valley. And they're certainly rocky as well. And that's exactly what you want. You want a climate that's not only nice and warm in the daytime, but cool nights as well. And what that helps you to do is to maintain your acidity. And certainly when it comes to method traditional, acidity is very important. And that's why we, we also pick early. You know, we hand harvest early because you don't, you want the bricks to be a little bit lower and you want that for structure and various other things but um so so we're very lucky to be incredibly close to that Wairau River and it used to be that in fact the Marlborough Valley before it was Marlborough <laughs> you'll like this Ross was called Beavertown uh, <laughs> believe it or not <laughs> and it's such a shame that then you know that could have been a great brewery name couldn't it and uh, yeah it is isn't it probably is a brewery name actually <laughs> it is it actually is do you know what it's one of it's I think it's like I can't remember, one of the Led Zeppelin um, band members, their son actually started a, a, a brewery called Beavertown in London. So someone did beat be Marlborough John to Bonham's it. son. It's probably John Bonham's son. Yeah, I, I, could be. I, I, don't I don't know. I'll go and I Google that know. after this. I, I want anyway, to know. There you go. And the reason being, though, that it was called Beavertown before Blenheim is that essentially the, the runoff of the glacier at the top of uh, the valley that used to as that runoff used to run right throughout the valley, like kind of rivers and streams everywhere. And the inhabitants of the area used to camp out on, on the banks of those rivers, like little beavers, not that there has ever been beavers in New Zealand or Marlborough specifically to my knowledge. I'm sure someone will correct me if I'm wrong. Anyway, so, <laughs> so the closer you are now to, that, to the, the remaining river, 
that's the younger soil. So we're very, very lucky with that. They're, they're nice and stony, rocky, which allows us to, um, allows those, those roots of the vines to really dig for nutrients and fight for them. So you actually want that stress, you want those roots under stress to get them to produce the best possible quality. And, and they, we're very lucky. That's what, that's the site we're sitting on. So, yeah. So with that, with that, uh, production and the the quality elements that you discussed. W which of the varietals that you plant, the Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Pinot Meunier, which always grows well? Which which is the one that is always bankable, for want of a better word, or or is it fairly even in uh, terms I of would... always always quality production? I mean, I know Pinot Noir is quite fickle sometimes, uh, yeah. and a lot and you you've got to that... really manage that one. But absolutely, I think for that reason, just pouring the number one now, just so you know. Um, for that reason, I would say the Chardonnay. As you always do. <laughs> <laughs> I would say the Chardonnay. But, but Pinot is, you're right, it can, be, it can be a very fickle mistress, and, you know, as, as the phrase goes. Um, and Pinot Meunier is something that you don't find that often in New Zealand. It's not quite as well suited to New Zealand as what it is to Champagne. So there's very little of it. We only have a couple of rows ourselves, but um, yeah, and that that goes into the assembly at the moment. As I said, uh, five percent of Pinot Meunier goes in there. So yeah. Um, anyway, speaking of Chardonnay, I would say for that reason, yes, Chardonnay is pretty good go-to uh, in terms of uh, its growing capacity with us and how it behaves, um, how it performs. And we also use um, the clone that predominantly we use at the moment is Mendoza clone. And with that, I believe you get a little bit of that chicken and egg. So some small berries, some larger berries, but on the whole, yeah, we're very, we're very fortunate in Marlborough that, that it's very well suited, not only to method, but just to the, to the Marlborough growing region as a whole. So, yeah. Sorry, yeah, I'm talking a so about... much, but as well oh it's this is what people <laughs> want to know i want to know i mean oh, yeah. that's okay <laughs> tell, us about, tell us about future plans <laughs> for number one uh future plans yeah. is there anything that you can share any future aspirations for the brand like anything under the hood that you guys are working on oh yeah we should always. be um having a look at always but of course always. method is is a long game so you, um, yeah. you know, we're not we're not doing a fast turnaround wine. Uh, we we certainly have some couple of things, a couple of things, as you said, under the hood, that are being worked mm. on. Um, and Remy has his first wine coming out too. So my younger brother and uh, and our um, our what did he call himself again? I said it the other day. Um, our junior winemaker, essentially. Uh, apprentice winemaker, thank you. There it goes. Uh, so, so yeah, he has his own wine coming out pretty soon, and that will be that will be very very exciting in the next year or two. I'm dead dead proud of him. It's fantastic what he's doing, and I did help him a little bit. Had a small helping hand in, in the production of that, which is quite sweet that he was happy to involve me in. But we also have, of course, um, executive winemaker, of course, Daniel Brun, our father, and in between Papa. Daniel and uh, Remy, we also have Lee Dobson, who's fantastic. He's been with us for, I think, 17 years now and trained under Papa as well. So we're pretty lucky. We've got a good, strong team. And um, that's just in the winery and in here. Wow. Even better. We've got a marketing, <laughs> where all the marketing fun girl. <laughs> yeah. We've when the real work um, happens, eh? <laughs> Yeah, in, in the last short, well, short while, a few months ago, we took on also um, Ellie Vincent uh, as our marketing manager, and she is fantastic the girl is a machine it's amazing she's brilliant um and so i'll, I'm, I'll tell you I'm one thing about ellie a lot too yeah oh i was emailing ellie she was emailing me at nine o'clock last night which is 11 o'clock new zealand time oh yeah and i was <laughs> i was messaging her go why are you still working and she goes well she's part-time at the moment and then i asked her to dish some goss or some dirt on you and she, all she could say was that you love animals so oh. she's flying the flag <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Good on you, Ellie. Didn't give away too much then. But yeah, I'm a total sucker for animals. I'm yeah. Bonkers. And we saw them. your um we saw your video with Pop. Pop? Yeah. Yep. Pop. Yep, Pop. So <laughs> yeah, I've got I've got little man down here. He's out cold. So if you hear some weird snoring, he's he's chasing something in his dreams. But there you go. So cute. Um, Vision, tell us about your favorite wine memory. What, what's your favorite wine memory that, mm. that keeps coming back? So I have and I have a couple. Um, one, I think one actually 
or two in fact, relate to one trip to Adelaide. And it was, you see the various trophies sitting behind here. And one was a trip to go and collect, um, this is years ago now, 2007, but this trophy, the Wine State um, National, what is it? Um, so actually the sparkling, sparkling wine of the year in 2007. So um, my brother Remy, Papa and I took a trip over to Adelaide to go and attend that uh, ceremony. We didn't know he was actually going to get the trophy in the end, but um, uh, it, was, it was pretty fantastic though. And I remember thinking as, you know, it's just a trans-Tasman flight. You go over and enjoy the flight. You get on there for what, two, three hours, three hours rather, and well, more to Adelaide anyway. Um, and and then you come back, it's all good. So there's no really point in maybe if you're super long haul going up a class or something like that. So, but I thought to myself, because I knew that they were pouring number one in business class. And I remember, and so I looked, I looked out into the aisle and saw, saw this being poured, this very wine being poured up there in business. And, and Papa told, Papa told the steward, I think, and he came down and gave him some actually of his own wine, which was quite cool. But I thought to myself, you know what? If we end up taking home that trophy, I'm going to do a secret little use my ear points and upgrade a sort of business class so I can get this fantastic shot of my papa holding the trophy in one hand and a glass of his own wine that won the trophy in the other. In business class. In business class. And what do you know? Fantastic. I did use those ear points and we did sit in business. And he had the biggest smile on his face. It was so cool. And it just, yeah, that was that was really lovely but actually another and on that same trip we also grabbed uh we went and did a tour of the Barossa as well and Langmill we went to this is a while ago now of course in 07 but um we went to Langmill and had some of the the Freedom Vines Shiraz I think it was and it was so beautiful it was just gorgeous and Papa said well we'll get two bottles of that and look after it and uh, and enjoy it. And I was like, great, that's really cool. So we had one and enjoyed that years later. And then it was one Christmas, I was in Auckland going to uh, fly down to Blenheim and I'd looked after it, perfect you know, condition, et cetera. And I had it wrapped up in some, uh, in like a polystyrene, you know, cover foam type thing. <sighs> and I opened the back of the car, <laughs> I opened the back oh. of the bloody hatchback. <laughs> And I can still remember it so vividly, <laughs> opening that and clonk, clonk, and that just that that sound of you go like, gosh, and I, I knew I knew instinctively what it was. It was the unsealing Bottom. of of the pump from the glass, and it was just like, oh, no, and there it was on the on the car park ground, and I dare I say it, I have never ever considered drinking one off the ground. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't, don't worry, I did not, I did not. But it, the thought crossed my mind because there's those, all, all those aromas and the memories of that trip and it all just stirred up and, I and I smelled there. that and it was heartbreaking. I mean, I wasn't even able to grab Papa and go, smell this. <laughs> I'm a dork, I know, but smell it, it's amazing. So that was, <laughs> that was real heartbreak. That was real heartbreak and a hard lesson, a very difficult oh. lesson to learn, most embarrassing. But, yeah, so... Both, both in, in Volvos. There you go. But yeah, that's de definitely know. that'd be that'd be two of my top top memories for sure. We yeah. Talk about putting wine on planes and travel international. I was doing a trip to South Africa in 2012, 2013 for business, I think it was, and I was catching up with some very long time friends and uh, some special people that I hadn't seen. So I took some bottles with me, and one of them was a 1990 Dom uh, Enateca. Oh, and right. some oh, wow. really old stuff, like old 78s and cabernets and bits and pieces. And for some reason, I didn't check them in properly with the airline. And they said, oh, you just got to put it in the freehold. Um, it was a bit weird. I don't know why I was thinking this way. And I thought, well, I don't know, I think those wines are going to get to Africa. But I was late for the plane, just got on the plane, went, well, there you go. Nice knowing you. There's a thousand bucks worth of wine. And lo and behold, I got to Cape Town and my bags came out and the bottles came with them. And I was like, Oh really? They were there. They were fine. Oh, we drank them all. It was great. Oh god! But I'd written them off. I was so prepared for that to go very, very badly. Yeah, I would have written them off. Yeah. Oh god! It should god. have gone by all accounts, but it didn't. So. Oh. And uh, um, what was the Enoteca like? How did 
was that pretty? Oh, uh, it was pretty pretty special because uh, I think on that trip there was also a, a, a bottle of Krug, a vintage Krug. I can't remember what it was now. Eighty eight, maybe. Okay. Um, there was uh, uh, Winston Churchill's being popped. It was a very extravagant trip. It was great fun. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. So what yeah. in terms Ta- of in terms of champagne, what's what what is your favorite of the or what are your couple of favorites it's Krug. from the big houses? It Krug? Wow. Vintage Krug. Vintage Krug. I can't afford my <laughs> habit, but it's vintage Krug. <laughs> Whenever enough, yeah. anyone says to me, What what do you like? Vintage Krug. <laughs> wow. Okay. That is that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. I I I thought that would be for for me too. I remember doing um a a masterclass over with Amethyst in the UK, um, and it was on Krug. And I remember being quite shocked. We had two vintages and a non-vintage and a non-vintage Magnum. Uh, the vintages, I think, were probably 03 and 05. And I remember being pretty shocked um, at the, the kind of the revelation to myself of w- what I preferred. I didn't like the vintages. What I liked was the the slower developed and arguably more complex magnum. And I thought that was bizarre. And but that that has actually continued on. And that's my preference is that if and it's I think it's got something to do with the with oak oak as well. And and the thing the thing I really find with vintages, generally speaking, anyway, is there's so much. It's a snapshot of a year. You know, the last thing I want to do is go and stick that in a barrel and put some other crazy stuff around it. <laughs> you know, it's a little bit like Salos. Salos does amazing non-vintages. I'll never forget the first time I tried one of those. I think it was a VO. And I put my nose in that glass and I was like, what is going on here? It was, it, 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 you, could, you could get some of that nice French oak. You were getting floral. You had these kind of honeysuckle honey indeed um you know woody notes all just it went in directions i never expected champagne to ever do it, it's similar to krug in that sense but more pronounced in, in the various places that it goes to but the problem or the interesting thing was is then when when i went to try the salos vintages you still got all that kind of not it's almost like running interference on your palate when you're trying to see the year, when you're trying to feel and get a sense and a taste of the year. It just, I, that's when I, I, I prefer other styles like, say, um, like Paul Roger, you know, and then their Winston Churchills are phenomenal for that, you oh, know, much, much, yeah. much more stripped back, paired back. Um, but yeah, that's it's but a great that's way a to drink that preference. as well. It's a great way to drink that. The, the Winston cigar, Churchill was in a spa bath. In a spa bath. <laughs> <laughs> you get too hot. To That's how I drink fast, my champagne. Right? <laughs> yeah. uh, nice. Um, we've we've just got a message here, that. Virginie, from <laughs> Mr. Matt Tain himself. Um, oh, it's hello, Lo- sweetheart. It's uh, Logan Plant. It's Robert Plant's son from Led Zeppelin. Thank you, With the, the, the brewery. Yeah, yes. there you go. Of course. And his the, um, Facebook picture looks like he's wearing an All Blacks jersey. So, you know, there we, yes. ding, ding Proud, bit, there we go. Do my bit. There we go. Do my bit. He'll be, he'll approve most definitely of that. <laughs> so, they, yeah, there you go. That's um, I think he has actually since sold the brewery, if I'm if I'm not correct in thinking. But um, yeah, it's a uh, it's it's a pretty it's a good name and things. But I am also like Remy a little bit jealous that someone from Marlborough didn't go. Let's call the brewery this, but oh well. <laughs> someone, someone, someone got the jump on on Marlborough for that one. So fair enough, good on them. And they make great beer. It has to be said, they're like their neck oil. Um, uh, gosh, what else? All sorts of stuff. Um, Gamma Ray is beautiful. It's a good everyday go to kind of thing. Every day. That sounds bad, doesn't it? Everyday yeah. drinking. Well, like your every day is. <laughs> you look at the stuff behind you. That would be your every days. I'm assuming. Tell me. I don't know. Horses Excuse for me. horses. Got a very important question for you. What was your first gig? I was thinking about this because you sent it sent it to me on the um Mum could probably tell me something like that. I think I think probably it was it was it would have been at a a wine and food festival, I'm sure. Someone like I definitely remember in the early days, someone like Midge Marsden playing 
that sort of thing. So that wasn't of my my own choice, what have you. That was sort of what you're exposed to. <laughs> you, what you grow up hearing. So not my choice, not my choice. But um, <laughs> I do remember a, a gig that really left an impression on me when um, when I was about 16 years old. I went to see Bob Dylan and Patti Smith uh, oh, in Christchurch wow. at an arena down there, or at a stadium down there. And I was there, admittedly, there to see Bob Dylan. But I tell you what, seeing Patti Smith was something else that was um, – that blew my mind. And we were very fortunate. Um, the people that I went with to the gig um, got us like third row back seats. So they were virtually front seats. And and so Patty Smith would do her thing of like rocking up and down the stage. She'd take off her shoes and socks and her, you know, boots and socks and rock up and down. And then she came along and she put like one one leg up on a um, on a monitor and go like this and kind of in the crowd at this point <laughs> i'm rocking. sitting more like i'm sitting more like this okay so i'm sitting <laughs> this is i'm sure mum is so thrilled with this papa will be shaking his head i'm sure watching this inside but i was sitting there with my ear, my knees more or less up around my ears rocking back and forth like this is amazing this is like a an epiphany moment for me as a teenager and and it was it was about her and her power and the, the presence that she had was just phenomenal. Um, and I was nodding like that and she just started nodding in time with me and looking straight at me. And I was like, ah! I was just waiting for my head to explode. Meltdown. Yeah, <laughs> something like that. So yeah, that was, that was amazing. That was sure. Of course, I've been a Patti Smith fan ever since. And, ever since, and, yeah. and that was a pretty tough act for, for Bob Dylan to follow her. And, of course, he could not be outdone by her. No way. <laughs> wow. She was great. And what was your last gig? What was your last, last gig? Last gig. I really scratched my head trying to think of that one. I can, I can remember two, two last gigs that I saw when I was in London were pretty amazing. Um, George Benson at the Royal Albert Hall. That was fantastic. But more, more outlandish-like a dream come true was to see Prince play at Ronnie Scott's Jazz Club on Frith Street in London. And that was to an audience of about 200 people. That's that pretty is, cool. That's oh, pretty cool. He, he is, well, That's pretty cool. the master. Wow. Yeah. Absolutely. And I share my birthday yeah. with him too. He was the 7th of June. I am also the 7th of June. Wow. There you go. An interesting that's, that's, piece of information cool. you'll never need. <laughs> oh, I love that. And what are you listening to at the moment? Oh, all sorts. Um, when you're speeding good. through New Zealand. Hello. <laughs> no, just Dig. not speeding. Just I, I along speed quickly. I during lockdown. That's what he's referring to. Okay, <laughs> for anyone going, what's that about? Um, oh, oh gosh, all sorts. I'm. I've certainly after I finished working in music TV, my interest, my musical tastes did go almost kind of backwards a little bit and I started listening to a lot more kind of funk and soul that sort of thing um and so it, it does change all the time but I'm still that's always a, a good stalwart for me um and uh what's termed as stone of rock it's like um the <laughs> queen queen the queens of the stone age um yeah and Josh Homme um, in the glass yeah and uh, Them crooked yeah, vultures. And, yeah, a little bit, but uh, uh, Caius is my favorite band. They, yeah. Ah, right. Always, so you're a big Josh Homme fan. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. yeah. I interviewed him once actually when I did um, when I was working on Juice, and it was they. You know, they say never meet your heroes. I remember you saying this the other day. Unfortunately, it was a never meet your heroes moment. Like it was yeah. cool to meet him. And I got him to sign my records and all that sort of thing. And I took all my friends' records as well for him to sign those. So I get a <laughs> stack bomb. to kind of get through. <laughs> but, um, but unfortunately, he kind of just kind of spent the interview hitting on me and in a really obvious way. And I was like, dude, mm. you've been – back in my mind, I was like, you've been doing this since you were 14 or 15 years old. Did it not get old or – are you not any more smooth at these this stuff? <laughs> it's just like, eh. so it was a bit of a, it was not, eh, uh, but it was a little bit because eh, it was just a letdown, you know. I wanted, I had yeah. serious questions that, that, but I was just, yeah, didn't give me the, didn't give me a, a great, um, 
a great uh, interview. Impression, I'm lasting that, impression. Yeah. yeah, but at the moment, the, my favourite song right now, it changes all the time, but Nina Simone, Baltimore. It's beautiful. It's like, it's heartbreaking. And I think quite, um, quite apt for the, for the age that we're now in and going forward when we all should be looking quite seriously at what, how we live our lives and, and the world that we are moving forward into. It's heartbreaking. And it really does make you kind of question ethics and, um, yeah, and how you go, go through life. So I'd recommend listening to it. It's beautiful and sad, unfortunately. But, yeah. Recommendation for you, if you haven't heard of an Aussie band from Melbourne called Kingswood, have a look at them. Oh, yeah. Uh, they've got three or four albums. There's, uh, there's some really great stuff there. I think you'd like that. It's that funk rock, uh, but really cool sounds. I've seen them about nine times. It's wow, a bit ridiculous. No. Uh, yeah, massive named fan of them. A classic car, of course. Named after a classic vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Um, Virginie, what do you see as the new normal for wineries um, mm. and the industry in general, uh, given that's, where we're at? That's a good question. This? Do you think we need a rosé for this question? I think we probably do. <laughs> uh, yep. We could have a rosé. Actually, you know what? I'm not, I'm not getting off the assembly. I really like that. I'm going to have some more of that here. Ah, there you go. That's always interesting to, to hear too how, how different people um, respond to the different wines and what, what their favourites are. For me, the rosé is a stunner, um, has and always will be. Um, so it's, if we keep making it like this, it always will be. <laughs> um, but it is, it's a beautiful wine. And I used to love doing like putting on Friday tastings in the Amethyst Soho shop in London. And um, what you called it, Friday tastings. <laughs> Consumer you <know>, so. <laughs> tastings, you cheeky. <laughs> No. Product research, yeah. <laughs> yeah, researching. Yeah. Uh, no, it was legitimately. I sound like absolutely became... fabulous when you said that. <laughs> the ab fab girls. Yeah, yeah, sweetie darling. Yeah, yeah. I was watching them the other, this might have even been last night or the night before, um, and their trip to Bollinger. And that was, that was pretty cool. Um, it's pretty fantastic. But And I definitely remember them from the 80s. Mum was a very big fan of Eddie and Pat. Uh, and fab, so yeah. But anyway, um, so it's 100% uh, Pinot Noir, and it is, to my mind, absolutely gorgeous. I, if you are, to, if you were to offer me, say, line up, um, give a number, uh, number one rosé against uh, all other uh, vintages, champagnes, um, uh, methods, etc and say to me, all right, would you like to have a glass of number one or a glass of Verve Rosé? And I'll have number one. Would you like X, Y, Z? You go right through the Moet, every, everything, uh, methods as well. Uh, and I will keep saying, so I just have a quick little look at the colour. It's gorgeous. Beautiful colour. It's gorgeous. That was not a very nice way to say it. It sounded sound like I'm a Geordie or something weird. Anyway, um, so the... The first time I will probably say, you know what, okay, maybe I will have that glass of champagne is Bilcar Samon um, Rosé. That is beautiful. And it's not often thereafter that I will keep saying, yeah, I will have that instead of number one Rosé. I am so proud of this wine, ridiculously proud of this wine. It, trophy after trophy it gets. And not only that, but as I said, with the consumer tastings I did at Amethyst, they, became our distri they are our distributor in the UK. Um, yep. Now and and were while I was in London, which is great. It's a bit like having a cellar door in, in Soho. What? Naughty me, selling too much of my own wine. Anyway, so I'd give people, you know, a taste of of the rose and say, "We're doing. Are we just doing some in-store tastings? Here's a here's a glass for you. Enjoy it while you're browsing." And they'd probably come back to me about a minute, thirty seconds later, and go, "This is lovely. So which one is this?" And they'd look straight to where the champagnes were. There was never any question that it was anything other than champagne. And they, they didn't look to where, to where the methods or the carvers, Prosecco, anything like that was. They, they always immediately assumed that it was, in fact, champagne. And um, that was, that's always a, a pretty fun moment to be able to do that. So, yeah. Um, but it's, it's an absolute stunner. It's really gorgeous. And I think if you taste it as well in, like, essentially a, a blind tasting class, like a... A, not a clear glass, a black glass, that you'll know that from the nose 
that's a rosé and it could not be anything else. It couldn't be a, a blend or what have you. It, to me, it tastes like it's a rosé and smells it too. Sorry, I'll get off my soapbox about that anyway. So, we're done so getting back to my question. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, new normal. So I get a bit What's the new normal? What, what, how, do, how are things going to be the new normal for wineries um, and once we start to push through or even while we're enduring the current situation? Yeah. What do you that think? That is a very good question. Um, I think I'm not sure. I think that it's one of these things that it is the unknown and we're all sort of in that position and, and we just we have to – hope for the best I think we have to hope for the best be prepared for the worst but um, you know thus far New Zealand has been in incredibly good hands our government has looked after us so well you know uh, has put the health of its of its population first and foremost and I, I couldn't be more grateful for that you know um, and I really hope they continue on that trajectory that they have been going on um, certainly they have my vote if I can be if I can be far too transparent and not talk politics etc but th they've done remarkable things and yeah as, so, as New Zealand citizens, beacon, I'm yeah. very grateful yeah, yeah we, all, so, we all look towards uh, New Zealand and I uh, think it's uh, it's definitely leading the way at the moment with what's happening and, yeah, yeah everyone wishes they lived in New Zealand <laughs> <laughs> well we'll see about, the, about we'll this, see this rugby team but anyway that's another story <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll all get back to, to that novel sometime. But I think, I oh, think I look there are positive. Coming. Yeah, it would, be, it would be nice, sure. But I think we just we need to sort all this out and do the the right things, the ethical things Absolutely. first and foremost. But and that's and I think that's probably the silver lining of what will the what the new normal will be, is it has us living more more consciously. You know, being grateful for the things that we have, for the things that we get to do every day, um, and granted, absolutely, yeah, definitely, definitely, and you know, and and create a future that hopefully is more sustainable. You know, in yeah, in many absolutely. regards. So yeah, I don't. Maybe should we be able to turn it around to look at it in a positive light? Hopefully, we can just grow from this. You know. Yeah. Yeah, and that, 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 that note, is my hope anyway. Yes. Note, I'm going to let you uh, get on with the rest of your evening. It is uh, 7.48, it's 9.40 p.m. in downtown Marlborough, and I'm sure you've got some nightclubs to hit. <laughs> Joking. <laughs> like, so, don't, don't shave. No, believe it or not, that was, <laughs> that was actually a real name of a nightclub in Blenheim. No kidding. It sounds, don't, don't sounds like somewhere I'd like to visit. Virginie Lebrun, number one estate. Thank you so much for your time and for joining us this evening. And Thank I look so forward to for many more us. banters. And I look forward to getting over to your beautiful neck of the world sometime soon because I haven't been to Marlborough and I need to get there. Absolutely. Uh, Come on down. Thank you for your Winners. time. Winners. And um, we will talk again soon. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. And stay tuned for the next episode of uh, Meet the Maker, which will be with... Uh, creation uh, estate i think it's on the 16th but they'll have more information on our socials until then get into some kiwi bubbles from number one estate take care be safe and thanks for joining us